Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to Growing in Grace Bible Study with Henry Cantu and Dylan Scoliades. Uh, let's pray. Father God, we just, mm, you are a good God. You love us. And we respond to your love with love in return, Father. You, we love you because you first loved us. Your word says that herein is love, not that we love you, but that you loved us. So we are fixating on your love today. We're fixating on your grace, your mercy, your unconditional love. Father, we want to introduce you to, uh, to, to the majority, to the people as, as a loving, caring God that invites us to cast all our cares on you because you care for us. This is you, and you are able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or imagine according to your power that goes to work in us once we are saved. So, Father, I thank you. Now, let's, 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 let's reveal you. Let's, 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 let's introduce you, Father. In the name of Jesus, let's pray. And let's, 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 in the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, here we go. You ready? Mm -hmm. This is what we've been teaching on for the past uh, three Bible classes, right? Yeah, part yeah. one, part two, and part three. Part three. Part we've been dus discussing these things. We're running on the last one. This is going to be part four. We discussed, we discussed uh, the difference between mercy and grace. We discussed living forgiven. We discussed spirit, soul, and body, and the love of God, his God's true nature. We discussed those in the past three parts. But this one, we really don't want to focus on the last one, number five, these are the five keys to understanding the gospel. And this last one is covenant confusion, the harsh teachings of Jesus. Okay, you can stop your video and can look at those. I even have scriptures there to support those. But this is covenant confusion. These are how we are to interpret the harsh teachings of Jesus. And that's important to understand the gospel because much of what Jesus said was not the gospel. We refer to them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John as the gospels. But the only one that was truly closest related to the gospel was the gospel of John because John doesn't have any harsh teachings. He doesn't have any of the parables. It could be very scary, very judgmental, very, very, very condemning parables. John just goes with believers and unbelievers, which is the gospel, right? That's the good news that if you believe, you receive. You believe, you believe and you receive everything that God is giving you for free. Right? And that's the gospel. Mm -hmm. Believers get it all. The Bible says we have all spiritual blessings in Christ. Here's the thing. Under the, under the old covenant, there was a curse. Deuteronomy 28 says you're blessed, you're blessed if you keep all the commandments, and you're, but you're cursed if you don't. Deuteronomy 28, go read it. He says if you keep all these commandments, all these blessings will come upon you. But if you don't keep all these commandments, he, he goes on to say in verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28, verse 14, 15, somewhere around there. He says, but if you don't keep all these commandments, all these curses will come upon you. And there was four times as many curses. So it was blessed if you do, you're cursed if you don't. Okay? And even in, in uh, Malachi, I think it's chapter 3, he says that all the nation of Israel was under a curse because they weren't tithing. and uh, were they Cursed because they weren't tithing. He says... He says, because you have not been bringing your tithes and offerings, you are under, the whole nation of Israel under a curse. You, you've been robbing God. And then he promises to open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing so great. If you do this, if you start tithing. The thing is that he put them, the thing is that that was under the law. Under the law, there was a curse, you know, for not doing things. But but Bible says, in, uh, in, in, in uh, let's see, is it uh, Galatians chapter 3, Paul says that Jesus became a curse for us. In Ephesians chapter 1, he says that we have all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. So Jesus became the curse for us. So we're just blessed in Christ, right? It's not blessed if you do, cursed if you don't. Jesus took the curse for you. The Bible says he became sin for you, right? Mm -hmm. In first, in, uh, 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 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says that Jesus became sin for us, that we might become the rights of God in him. And it says in Galatians chapter, chapter 3 that Jesus became a curse for us. He says if you go under the law, you go under a curse because you have to do everything written in the whole book. But he goes on to say that Jesus became a curse for us. 
So we're just blessed under this new covenant. And we need to understand that because you go to Sermon on the Mount and it goes, talks at length about who's blessed. You know, you're blessed if you do this. You're blessed if you do this. You're blessed if you, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who are pure of heart. He talks about all these blessings. But if you go read those, all of those, that's all that a Christian gets all of that. Right? The Bible says we can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace anytime we need it as a believer. Right? So we can come and get mercy anytime we need it. He says he's being merciful to our unrighteousness. So who gets mercy in the new covenant? Believers. Right? So it's not you have to be mercy, merciful to earn mercy. That's a works relationship. Right? right? right. That's where you got to work it. That's blessed if you do, you curse if you don't. If you don't show mercy, you're not going to be mercy. You're not going to get mercy. You got to give mercy to get mercy. It's blessed if you do, you curse if you don't. Like he said elsewhere in Sermon on the Mount, if you forgive, you'll be forgiven. But if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Right? Right? Right. If you forgive, you'll for he'll forgive you. But if you don't forgive, he won't forgive you. You're blessed if you do, you curse if you don't. It's it's blessed if you do, curse if you don't. All that was law language. It's not like that in the new covenant. And I'm going to prove it to you. You ready? Yep. So, okay, let's look at Luke 11:13. Okay, I want to show you this. What I'm teaching here is, is, is this is, these, these are these guys, you can, you can look at this, this is called, let me see if I can put this up here. People are teaching this, just it's not commonly taught like it should be in the church, okay? Let me see if I can put, the, okay, there it is. You see that? That is a podcast. There's 20 episodes. It's, 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 it's called Why Jesus Taught Two Covenants, okay? And, and it's, it, it, there's 20 episodes, they're 15 minutes each. And it's just two guys talking, and it's called Grace Roots, Growing in Grace, okay? And um, you can go on that link, and if you tap on that link, okay, you got a whole list of all of them. Oh, let me see. Yeah, you got a whole list of all of their, the, the whole playlist. You can, you can play all the, all the episodes, okay? So, um, but they do, this is being taught out there. Many people are teaching this. I have many books that detail this. Okay, that Jesus actually was teaching two covenants. Most people aren't sharing, telling you this, right? They think everything Jesus said is grace, you know, but it can't be if he's threatening judgment and condemnation and hell, right? Yeah. Let's look at this. Go to Luke eleven 13. I'm going to show you something. You ready? Mm -hmm. Luke eleven thirteen. 13. See if I can get through all this. There's a lot here. I've got a lot to look at. Okay, we're going to try and do this. Okay, uh, what am I doing? Okay, Luke eleven thirteen. 13. Is that what I said? Yeah. Okay, look at this. Here it goes. Um, 11, 13. Yeah, I'm on 12, 13. Thank you. Okay, here it goes. This is in Luke, okay, this is something that was mentioned in Sermon on the Mount, but in Luke, this is kind of like spread out and all over the place, different places. But Jesus said something similar in uh, Sermon on the Mount. He said, he said this a little bit differently in Sermon on the Mount. He said, if you then, being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So he's saying to ask for the Holy Spirit, you'll get him, right? That's reasonable, Right? In the uh, in uh, Sermon on the Mount, he said that uh, you, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? So he said, he just said good gifts, but here he's saying the Holy Spirit, right? So, but go to this. Go to Galatians 4.6. Right, Galatians 4.6. Mm -hmm. You got it? Yep. Okay, but wait a minute. Uh, put one finger there. And go to John. Remember, John just goes with believers and unbelievers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got to take, notice how a lot of these go to John for the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, you know, what, new covenant message. Okay, they're all true. Uh, everything that they're writing is true, but there is something that would be true for them under the law when Jesus was walking down around on this earth that would not be true for us living after the cross, living under grace. Okay, so it's all true, but there are things that would be for them that would not be for us, and things that would be for us that would not be for them. So things that Jesus said to them, it was true for them at that time, but would not be true for us living under grace as a believer. 
Okay, you understand? That's why the Bible says to rightly divide the word of truth. There is truth, but you have to rightly divide it, which what would be true for them and what would be true for us. There's a scripture. It says, I think, it, where is that? In, in Peter, right? So who said that uh, to rightly divide the word of truth? Oh, that's in... Um, Timothy. Timothy, yeah. Yeah, Timothy. For, Paul said it to Timothy. <clears throat> yeah. Right. right. Yeah, it's, for, it's in First or Second Timothy. Right? Right. Rightly divide the word of truth, meaning that there is a dividing of the truth... Why would you have to divide the truth? Because the, the cross is the dividing line. Right. Right? Right. Christ, the cross is what divided the Old Covenant from the New Covenant. We call that the New Covenant. We call that the New Testament, where Je the Gospels, but Jesus didn't go to the cross until the end of those Gospels. Mm -hmm. So that is not the New Testament error until he goes to the cross. Mm -hmm. So he is, Jesus is not ministering New Covenant language all the time. He, when, he puts it on, when he puts it on them, it, it's law. When he puts it on him, it's grace. When he says, you've got to be more anxious than the Pharisees to get into the kingdom, that's law. He's putting it on you. You have to be more righteous than the Pharisees if you, if you're, or you're not going to get into the kingdom. He's putting it on you. Elsewhere, he said, you must be born again to see the kingdom, Right? And then when he explained how you get born again, he said, who believing on the Son, right? Right. So that's where he's putting it on him. You get a new birth through faith in him. That's where you become the righteousness of God through Christ. He gives you his righteousness for your faith. It's a faith righteousness in the new covenant. It doesn't matter how righteous you are in and of yourself. You could try to be more righteous than the Pharisees all day long. You're still not going to get in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. it's not, you can't earn The Bible says no one was justified by the law. No one is righteous by the law. No one, Paul said, no one is righteous. No, not one. Nobody could be righteous enough to earn heaven. It's not going to happen. That's You're not going to get in the kingdom by your own righteousness, right? right? In the New Covenant, it says in Romans chapter 10 that we are to stop establishing our righteousness and submit to a righteousness of God that he gives as a gift because Jesus ended the law for righteousness. When did he end it? At the cross, right? Right. So here we go. So uh, what I say, go to John, go to John 1 first, because you need to lead with this. Because he said to ask for the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Just ask for the Holy Spirit, okay? And you'll get him. Now, he's saying that before the cross, uh, okay? He's just talking about, hey, you're evil. You give gifts to your kids. Hey, God will give the Holy Spirit to anybody who asks, right? Right. John chapter 1 says this. Okay, you ready? Yep. Verse 12, but as many as received Jesus, received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Okay, so here he's talking about receiving Jesus, you have a right to become children of God. Okay, right? Go back to Galatians chapter uh, 4, 6. Here he says, and because you are sons. See, here's how you get the Holy Spirit. It's not about asking for him. You receive Jesus, you have a right to become the child of God, and now because you're... Let me fix that. There it goes. Okay. Okay, so now, notice there's nothing about asking. He just says you receive Jesus, you have a right to become a child of God, and here he says, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Right. Okay, so there's nothing about asking. Right. It's just receiving. You receive Jesus, you have a right to become a child of God, and now that you're a son, he sends his spirit into your heart. Amen. Not asking. Yeah, it's receiving. Yeah. Yeah. It's believing on Jesus. Believe and receive. Right? right? Nowhere in the New Testament after the cross does it talk about asking for the Holy Spirit. That was something Jesus said before the cross. Okay? Here he's saying he just gives them to you because you believe. You receive, you receive Jesus. You're a child. You're my child. I don't let my children go without the Holy Spirit. You receive Jesus, you have a right to become a child of God, and now because you're my kid, I, pour, I give you my spirit, the spirit of Christ. Okay, there you go, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a difference, right? Right. Um, go here, go to, okay, look at this. Go to, go to, go to Matthew, okay, um, Matthew 6, 14. This is heavy. We've got to get through this. Mm -hmm. Matthew 6, 14, you ready? Yep. Easy. This is deep. Okay. Jesus taught them how to pray. Now remember, who is he speaking to? The Pharisees and to, the, to all, the, all of Israel. 
Yeah, he's speaking to people that are in the flesh. In the flesh. And, and Romans chapter 8 says that the, those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's who he's speaking to. The Bible talks about how he, how he would, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit would come upon people, right? Mm -hmm. he came, the Holy Spirit came upon David, okay? Uh, the Holy Spirit came upon Gideon. The Holy Spirit came upon Samson twice. One time he came upon Samson and he killed a lion. Another time the Holy Spirit came upon him and he, ki he killed a thousand people with, a, with nothing but a jawbone. But it says the Holy Spirit came upon them. In the New Testament, Jesus talks about when I send the Holy Spirit, he will abide with you forever. So there was a pawn and there was a bide. When he comes and abides in you, Jesus said that the, those that, are, that which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. Mm -hmm. Right? So he drew a line. Right. So when you, but he referred to that as being born again. So when you're born again through receiving Jesus and becoming a child of God, when you're born again, you go from the flesh into the spirit. You are not in the flesh anymore. David, Samson, Gideon, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were still in the flesh. Oh, wow. That's heavy. Yeah. 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 Right? Right. Because the Bible says you're not in the flesh if the Spirit of God be in you. It says that in Romans chapter 8. Oh, he says the flesh cannot please God. But those that are in the, but you're not in the flesh if the Spirit of God be in you. So they were all in the flesh. Wow. They could not please God. Right? Right. Now he's saying this to those people that are in the flesh, those that are under the law, and they're trying to keep the law. You know, the, you know they're, they didn't know how well they keep the law. It never made them right with God. What made them right with God? Their uh, faith. Animal blood. Animal blood, yeah. Animal blood covered their sins. Right, right, right. So they could still have a right relationship with God. Their, their relationship with God could continue, and God would cover their sins, and he would still bless them. He would, all the curses that would come upon them because they weren't keeping the law. Remember, Deuteronomy 28, if you don't keep all these commandments, all these curses would come upon you. But he would withhold all those curses because nobody was keeping all the commandments. Of course not. Especially all of Israel. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. None of them were. Right. right? So, but to keep them from being cursed, they could eat Day of Atonement where they could sacrifice animals and they would do this ritualistic thing the way they could sacrifice, and those an animal blood would cover their sin. That's where they found right standing with God. Mm -hmm. It was never because of their performance. How much more today, under the New Covenant, is it about the blood of Jesus? Amen. Okay? Mm -hmm. Which is better than any animal blood, right? No human blood could, cover, could take the sins away of the world. No angel blood. If angels could bleed, their blood couldn't take away the sins of the world. Animal blood, that was used back then in the Old Covenant, but it only covered their sins temporarily because that was something God just sanctioned. Yeah. It wasn't a power in the blood. It was on credit. The yeah, the, 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 there was no power in the animal blood. It's just yeah. animal blood. Was the power symbolic. was in that God uh, sanctioned that. It was just symbolic of God saying he pushed their sins into the future. For future sacrifice, he was putting it. Yeah, was that's a good it, point. He off. He said, because the scripture says, I think it's in Romans where he said that uh, he um, pushed their sin. He was he was imputing their sins at that time because he was waiting. He was waiting for the yeah, he, like he he's, come. Yeah. like he says in Hebrews chapter ten. Yeah, he says those sacrifices could never really take away your sins. Go read right. Hebrews ten, chapter right. one on. Right. Chapter 1 through 5, it says those old sacrifices can never really take away your sins. Mm -hmm. But the point he's making is that Jesus does, right? Right. In Hebrews chapter 10, go read it. It says that those could never really take away your sins. But Jesus, through him, we're sanctified once and for all. Those mm -hmm. sacrifices, can, there was a constant reminder of sins. But this one, he remembers them no more. The, he says those sacrifices can never make you perfect. But this sacrifice, he perfects you forever. You see, so those could not do what Jesus does. Mm -hmm. Okay, we need to really understand what Jesus did for us, what we have in him. Right? Right. The Bible says we're righteousness of God in Christ. He says he became sin for us that we might become the rights of God in Christ. And there's a might there. There's no might in him becoming sin for you. It says he became sin for us that we might become the rights of God in him. There's a might there because it takes faith. You've got to believe and receive the righteousness of God by faith. Mm -hmm. You just submit to a righteousness of God and stop establishing your own. It says that in Hebrews 10, verse 4. Stop establishing your own and just Romans submit to a righteousness. What did I say? Hebrews. Okay, yeah, Romans 10, 4. Thank you. Okay, so let's look. Verse 14, Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, your Father, uh, neither will your Father forgive you yours. Okay, right? Yeah. Okay, so you got to earn it. 
you got to be a big forgiver if you want to be God to for, forgive you. Wow. You got to be big on your forgiving to earn God's forgiveness. Yeah. You got to earn it. That's called works of the law, deeds of the law. You have to. You're blessed if you do. You're cursed if you don't. That is totally law language. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Deuteronomy 28 tells you that is language of the law. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay, so now let's look at, uh, look at Luke 6.37. This is huge. Nobody's teaching this stuff. Luke 6.37. You ready? Amen. Judge not and you will not be judged. See, you got to be big on, you got to never judge or you're going to be judged. You got to earn it, mm -hmm. right? right? Condemn not, you will not be condemned. You got to earn no condemnation. What does the Bible say? There's no condemnation for you in Christ, okay? Mm -hmm. But here it's talking about earning it by being big on not condemning so you won't be condemned. Then it says, okay, so it says, judge not, you will not be judged. Condemn not, you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Again, you got to earn forgiveness, right? Right? right. So there it's, it's saying that you have to earn this. Okay, you, you with me? Right. Look at Matthew 18, 35. I don't want to belate this. I don't want to go too crazy with this. Matthew 18, what did I say? Matthew 18, 18 35. 35. This is, uh, uh, I think this is where there's a, uh, this is about what? The unforgiving servant. Yeah, 18. Yeah, right? I, I don't want to go through the whole, whole story because that would take too much time. Right. But I just want to let you land on the end, what he ends that parable. Remember, there are no parables in the Gospel of John. Yeah. He doesn't even go with his threats of judgment and condemnation that Jesus goes through with the Jews living under the law. Right? right. Matthew is written to the Jews. Right. A lot of this judgment, condemnation, and hell talk all through Matthew. Wow. Right? Wow, we're not under that. Seriously. Yeah. Right? And even in the parable, the parables, which you got to understand, a lot of the, par the parables could be very scary, you know, right? Bridesmaids being locked out, you know, half of them because of their oil. The thing is, m many of these are prophetic. These parables, they're prophetic. Just like Jesus talking about, if you believe on him, you, 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 won't, you'll be you won't be condemned. That's prophetic. Uh, that's something you're going to get through the cross. Right. That's prophetic. Right. Like he says, if you believe, believe, like he told Martha, you believe on him, you'll never die, mm -hmm. right? Well, the things that Jesus said, he said, if you believe on him, you won't perish. You'll have eternal life. That's trusting what he's about to do with the cross. That's prophetic. Mm -hmm. Just like the parables, many of them are prophetic. When he told that story about the guy with the wedding gown, what did that mean? We could look at that, but you, know, you wonder, what is he talking about? Some guy in a wedding gown coming to a wedding feast, and he invited these people to come, but they didn't want to come. So he went out and said, just go and get anybody and bring anybody out in the alleyways, the streets, and just get anybody and bring them and see if they'll come. And, 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 and some of them came, but there was one guy that didn't have a wedding gown, and he, he was thrown out to the torturers. He's scary. He, was, he said he didn't have a wedding gown, so he had him thrown out. He says, why don't you wear the wedding gown? He said, oh, well, you know, I forget what he said, but he, he just... He, he, he was speechless. Him, yeah, he says he was speechless. He didn't know what to say. Yeah. So he had him thrown out to the torturers, it says, right? Right, right. So... Yeah. But, but, but what is all that? At the time, I, I'm sure they were probably clueless. You've got to understand, many of these parables that Jesus told were not meant to truly be understood until later, until after he goes to the cross. Yeah. Today, we look at that. I know who the wedding gown is. It's me, rode with the righteousness of Christ. That's why I'm not going to be thrown to tortures. Okay? The, who was it that it, did, did he invited, that he first invited, that didn't want to come? The, the Jews. Jews. The Jews. Right? They didn't understand that at yeah. the time. When he told that parable, they didn't understand any of that because they hadn't rejected him yet. They didn't crucify him yet. Right. Right? Right, of course. So they didn't understand that that's who's rejecting him. But he said that then, then, then and how they taught, they killed and beat, had beaten the people that he's, that, uh, man, we should look at it, but it's, it's heavy. The point I'm trying to make is that that was a prophetic, not meant to understood until later. Many of these parables were meant to be understood later. Well, that's why even, even his disciples came in and said, what did that parable mean? A lot they, of they didn't understand. Were about salvation, because it uh, says the parable of the sower. If you don't understand that parable, you won't understand all the others. Exactly. Jesus said. So, if you, the parable of the sower is about salvation, exactly. Jesus. So, sowing so, the word, sowing yeah, the gospel, yeah, so either, and receiving it. It's those who accept Jesus or those who reject Jesus. Yeah. A lot of it, if you look at it from that perspective, then 
and, and that's how you got to read the parables. You got to know that there there is a salvation message buried in those parables, and just okay. like that one about the the, the wedding gown, yeah. right? Right. But but this one here, let's look at this. Okay, um, Matthew eighteen thirty five. He says, "So my heaven." He says, "Okay, this this guy was forgiven a huge debt, mm -hmm. and then somebody and, and by the king, and then somebody came in and owed him a little debt, and he wouldn't forgive him. Uh, he wouldn't. He, he made. He had him. He what did he say? He said." Um, he said, okay, he wouldn't forgive this guy this small debt. And he had him thrown to the tortures because he wouldn't forgive that guy that little debt when he forgave him this huge debt. And Jesus says this at the end. He says, so my heavenly father will do you if each of you from your heart does not forgive his brother's sins. So he's saying that you will be thrown to the tortures like him. He says, and his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that was due him. And he says, so my father would do you if you don't forgive from your heart. He's mm -hmm. saying you've got to earn not being thrown into tortures wow. by forgiving people. Yeah, true. There's a threat of being thrown to hell, if you read that, Yeah. for not forgiving. Because he would never get out. You know? Right? Yeah. So, um, but go to 1 John 2.12. Now, I'm not taking away from forgiving, but in the New Covenant, it's you are forgiven first. You do not earn forgiveness. Why did Jesus go to the cross? The Bible says he was manifest to take away our sins. Okay? Jesus himself said elsewhere that every sin will be forgiven except for blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which would be rejection of Jesus Christ. So every sin will be forgiven, mm -hmm. including unforgiveness. Right? If you're having a problem forgiving somebody, he says every sin will be forgiven. Right. Unless you think unforgiveness is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. I don't think so. No. Okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So he says every sin will be forgiven. That includes whatever he said in Sermon on the Mount, you know, if you don't turn the other if you don't turn the other cheek, if you if you don't forgive, if you don't reconcile, right? If you don't go the extra mile, if you don't give to everybody, you don't lend to everybody, if you lust, if you get angry, which is he threatened judgment. If you lust, he said, is the same as adultery. If you do any of those things, he said elsewhere, Jesus himself in Matthew, <coughs> in the same book, said every sin will be forgiven. Why did he say will be? Because he's pointing to the cross. It's prophetic. Sometimes he would prophetically speak about what's going to come to the cross. Other times he'd talk about right here and now. At times he would put it on you. At times he'd put it on him and what he's going to provide through the cross. At times you put it on you and what it means to live under the law mm -hmm. today. Right. Right? Right. Serious. You gotta be able to read what he's doing. What is he doing? Look at this. First John 2:12 says, I write you little children. Now he's talking to what what did he say? Because uh, we if all those who receive Jesus, you have a right become children to become a child of God. So when he says, I write to you, little children, because he's talking to <coughs> believers now, yeah. right, who yeah. have received the Holy Spirit. He said, mm -hmm. because your sons, I send my Holy Spirit into the Spirit of Christ into your heart, right? We read that. Now he's talking to children. He says, I write to you, children, because your sins are forgiven. What happened to you got to forgive to be forgiven? What happened to you got to earn it? Mm. He says to the children, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. You're forgiven. Totally forgiven. What did Jesus say? Every sin will be forgiven. That comes through the cross. Mm -hmm. This is for people way after the cross. Believers living after the cross. Your sins are forgiven. Right? Right. You don't earn it. Why else did he go to, why did he go to the cross? To take away your sins. Go to, go to 1 John chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Now we need to know this. You got to know this. And we, and you know, Dylan, look, I'm talking to you right now. Dylan, okay, listen, because what are we talking about? Forgiveness, okay? Forgiven of what? Sin, right? Why do I need forgiveness? For sins. Yeah. O okay? Right. right? Right? Now watch, I'm talking to you, a believer now, okay? Look what it says. Verse 5, right? First John 3, 5. Dylan, you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. You, Dylan, as a believer, you should know that he was manifested to take your sins away. So they're not here. He took them away. If he took them away, they're not here. Right. They're not here. Right. He took them away. 
And it says, we know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there's no sin. Are you in him? Absolutely. There's no sin. Right. If you don't believe that you're in fear in him, there's no sin. Well, you're saying, well, I guess he didn't take them away. Mm. If you don't believe that if you're in him, there's no sin, well, you're saying that he didn't take them away. But if you believe that you're in him and there's no sin, then you believe he took them away. Mm. Are you, does that make sense? That's heavy. It is heavy, yeah. If I believe that I'm in Christ and because I'm in him, there's no sin, because it says in him there's no sin. If I believe that I'm in him and there's no sin, well, then I really do believe that he took them away. And he says we need to know that. That we know he was manifested to take them away and in him there's no sin. He really took them away. I'm not in my sins. 1 Corinthians 5, 3 says that. We're not even in our sins. Go there. Go to 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 15. 1 Corinthians 15 says that we're not in our sins. This is deep. I'm trying to tell you we're not, you're not in your sin. He really was manifested to take it away. God was in Christ, not imputing them. The Bible says that he became sin for us. Right? Right. So if that's true, within the, you got to believe this too. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ is not risen, is he risen? He is risen. Okay. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. That means useless. Your faith does you no good if he's not risen. Okay? And you are still in your sins. So if Christ is not risen, your faith is useless. You're still in your sins. But wait a minute. You've got to rewrite, reread this. Okay. But Christ is risen. Therefore, my faith is useless, useful, useful because I believe he rose. Yeah. And I am not in my sins. Right, right. Go read that. You've got to read that from a context. Read it one night. You've got to look at two sides of the coin. He says, if Christ is not risen... Your faith is useless. You're still in your sins. But I believe he did rise. So, he has risen. Therefore, my faith is useless. Use I am not. Useful. U useful, yeah. He, I believe he is risen. Therefore, my faith is useful. And I am not in my sins. Right. See, you're in him. You're not in your sins. He has manifested to take them away. He really became sin for you. And you are really now the righteousness of God in him. Who? Are you kidding me? So you see that. Go here. Go to Ephesians 1 7. I'm proving to you that you are forgiven. We're supposed to be living forgiven. Right? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1 7 says this In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Okay? Are you forgiven? Absolutely. You have redemption. Redemption is the forgiveness of sins, and we have that. Okay, you are redeemed. Mm -hmm. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that we have redemption, sanctification, righteousness. All of that we have, right? We, uh, um, it says of, of Christ, we Christ have wisdom. Become, yeah, yeah. Huh? how is it? Christ has become to us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Yeah, there you go. So we have that. We have redemption, right? The yeah. forgiveness of sins. Go to Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also has, past tense, forgiven you. Mm -hmm. Now this is Jesus speaking through Paul. Paul is writing this, but this is the Spirit of Christ in Paul speaking. Right? right. Word of God. Mm -hmm. This is the Word of God. That means this is God speaking through Paul. Mm -hmm. Right? Right, right. So, this is Jesus. People miss this. This is Jesus too. This is Jesus before the cross saying, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Speaking to people living under the law. All right? This is Paul speaking to believers living under grace way after the cross. And he says to forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Two totally different programs. Right? Right. And I could go to Colossians, says the same thing. You can go to Colossians 1.14 and 3.13 in Colossians. They say the same thing too, right? I don't want to belate this because I have much more to say, okay? But act, go to Acts 13. If you want to go and look at those Colossians 1.14 and 3.13, you could look at those too. They say the same thing, that we are to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. Past tense, already done. That we have redemption. It says the same thing as Ephesians, identical, mm -hmm. right? Right. So he's telling, the, he's telling the Colossians and the Ephesians that this is the program under grace, right? And we need to know this. 
We need to know he really was manifest to take away our sins and that we're in him and there's no sin. That I have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And now I is counseling me to forgo and forgive the way I've been forgiven. Mm -hmm. Pass it on. Yeah. Jesus said a new commandment, I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So he's saying, go and forgive others the way I have forgiven you. Right? <clears throat> Not forgive to be forgiven. Whew. Seriously. You with me? Yeah. Okay, go to Acts 13. This proves my point be better than anything. I can't, to prove my point, I got to... Uh, to show you that Jesus was doing one thing over here and what Jesus was doing over there. He could not preach what we have here because what we have here was not available over there. Okay, what Jesus was doing over there, he'd minister at times law, putting you under law, putting you under condemnation so that you'll want what he's about to do for you so you'll, want, so you'll receive a savior. Okay, so you want the blood of Jesus to cover your sins. You got to see yourself a sinner. You got to see how far you fall short, that you need a savior. So at times he would do that and use law to do it. The Bible says the law is a ministry of condemnation. So we put you under condemnation with the law to help you see your need for a savior. Right. So at times he would do that to people that were in unbelief. They weren't seriously, you know, whatever it was. They just needed to really get a good picture of where, they're, where they stand so they want what he's offering. Mm -hmm. right? right? And other times he would prophetically tell you he's the solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. He said, if you believe on the Son of, Son of God, you won't perish but have eternal life. If you believe on him, you won't be condemned, right? right? If you believe on him, no wrath. He said, if you believe on him, you won't be judged. These are all things he says in the Gospel of John. Go read the Gospel of John. That's the, that's the direction John goes. The Gospel of John just goes with believer and unbeliever. Everything you're going to get through belief. No threats of judgment, no threats of condemnation, no scary parables, just believer and unbeliever. These people even came in the Gospel of John. They said, came to Jesus and they said, what must we do to do the works of God? Right? And Jesus said, this is the work, to believe on the one whom he sent. Very simple. Believing is the work that he wants. Mm -hmm. right? right? But that will get good works. I'm not, this doesn't take away from living godly, from doing good things. Sermon on the Mount is a beautiful sermon if you just focus on what grace is. Is it great? Would it be grace? To not just forgive, but to actually reconcile? Mm -hmm. To actually go that extra mile? Not just forgive them, to actually reconcile with them. That's what he taught in Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. That's what grace does. Grace goes the extra mile. It isn't just mercy. Oh, I forgive you. I'm not going to hold a grudge. I'm not going to be vindictive. I forgive him. Therefore, I earn forgiveness because I'm so forgiving. He actually said to go and reconcile with those that have got a problem with you. Mm -hmm. He said, don't even bother to bring your gift against, against, unless you go and reconcile first, mm -hmm. if somebody's got a problem with you. He didn't even talk about you having a problem with them. He said, if they got a problem with you, go and reconcile. So he didn't just say forgive. He said reconcile. That's, that's grace, going the extra mile, right? right? So there is a love factor in the Sermon on the Mount, but you cannot take Sermon on the Mount the way that he preached it, because the way that he preached it was a law-based message threatening you with judgment, condemnation, hell. That's all in there. Mm -hmm. So if you take it the way he preached it, you would have to take the judgment too, which would be un, would be that, that would make that would hurt that would grieve the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's grieving the Holy Spirit, knowing what Jesus did for you through the cross, dying in your place, suffering your punishment, becoming sin for you. Knowing what he did, th to take that message of Sermon on the Mount the way that Jesus preached it, and taking all that punishment and threats of judgment, take that take it the way he preached it. You'd be, that's legalism. You'd be a legalist, right? Right. But there is a love factor. Should I turn the other cheek when somebody strikes me? Sure, that's a loving thing to do. Should I love my enemies, bless those who curse you? Should I give? Should I lend the things that he says there? Sure, there's a loving thing. There's a love factor. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, love others the way I love you. And that's what he did in Sermon on the Mount. Everything he said in Sermon on the Mount to do, he did. Mm -hmm. He reconciled us unto God. He forgave us at the cross. There's your forgiveness. There's the reconciliation. He did that for us. He, he did that for us and God. Between us and God. He did that for us. Between us and God. He turned the other cheek. He let them crucify. He said, I could call down 12 legions of angels. They'd defend me right now if I wanted to. Right. You know? So he turned the other cheek. He let them do it. He let them nail, he let them nail him to the cross. He could have had angels defend him. Mm -hmm. And he didn't. Right. So he turned the other cheek. He loved his enemies. He prayed for them. Said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Everything he said in Sermon on the Mount, he did. Mm -hmm. And he tells us later, love others the way I love you. 
So he's telling us to pass on what he's giving us. Amen. That's new covenant message. Right. You got to take a good look at what he did for you, the love he has for you, and pass it on. Share it. That's what I'm preaching. That's what I'm teaching. I'm not taking away from loving people, doing good, loving God. I'm not taking, I'm just telling you it's come from a, a new heart. In the new covenant, he gives you a new heart. He puts you under a new covenant, right? It's, right. A, it's a new program. All things are new, he says. You become a new creature and all things are new. Mm -hmm. You with me? Yeah. Okay, so Acts 13, right? Yeah, 38. 38. Acts 13, 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached to you. See, that's what I'm preaching to you. What comes through this man, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Through this man, Jesus, is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. See, total forgiveness through this man, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right? When right. he said, if you forgive, you'll be forgiven. That's not forgiveness coming through Jesus. Right? Right. It's just your that's own, you own, earning, own, it. earning it. Yeah. You're working for yeah, it. That's works of the law, deeds of the law. Right. That's putting it on you to earn it. He says through this man Jesus is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Through him. Mm -hmm. Through him is forgiveness. Right? right? And by him, everyone who believes, everyone who believes is justified. That means declared not guilty from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. You know what that means? You know what that's saying? That's saying this was not available when Jesus was walking around on this earth. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus said that I did not come to abolish law, I came to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he was under the law. He came to fulfill the law. He was under the law. The Bible says he was born under the law. Right? right. He himself said right before Sermon on the Mount, not one jot or tittle of the law is going to be removed until he fulfills it. Mm -hmm. Right? He had to fulfill right. it at the cross. Right. Right? right? So when he said not one jot or tittle, he's saying still right now, today, every dot has to be, every I has to be dotted, every T has to be crossed, every jot and tittle. It's still in the works. And then he goes into the Sermon on the Mount expounding on the law. It is a law, it is law language. It is. Right? Right. But he says that he could not, that was not available under the law. It says that. Go read Acts 13, 38, and 39. That wasn't available under the law. That wasn't available when Jesus was walking around this earth. He had to go to the cross first, right? You, you follow that? Yep. Um, John 14, 16. This is good. I got a lot of stuff here. We might have to go another, cl another class for this. John 14, 16. Verse 16, he says, in, um, if, he says, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So he's talking about sending another helper. The whole, he explains, he says, even the spirit of truth, right? Yeah. So he's talking about sending another helper, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, to abide with you forever, right? right. Okay, you with me? Yep. He's talking about he will send, I will send, right? Okay, go to 1 Corinthians 6.17. This is good. Now, this is after the cross. This is for believers. He says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? So there he's talking about sending him. Here he's talking about you got him. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So that was prophetic, something that's coming after the cross. This is now. People take that as that's now. You know? Oh, yeah, the other one. The, the other they, one. they take what Jesus is saying, you've got to forgive yeah. to be forgiven. They're taking that that that's now. Right. You gotta forgive to be forgiven, you know, you, you know, you gotta you gotta be perfect. Mm -hmm. As he is perfect. They're taking that as now. The Bible says in 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 in, he, in Hebrews 10, 14, that through that one sacrifice we have been perfected forever. There he's talking about you gotta be perfect. You know, in it. Right? Right. You with me? Yep. Okay, so um so here he says you got the Holy Spirit, right? And there are many others like that. Look at this one. Look at uh, Matthew twenty two thirty six. Matthew twenty. This is good. Matthew twenty two thirty six. Boy, I got a lot here. I got to get through this. Matthew twenty two. What thirty six? Yep. Here it is through forty. Matthew twenty two through thirty six through forty. This man comes to Jesus and he says, "Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law?" Mm -hmm. Jesus said, 
to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor the way you love yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Okay, so the man asked for the law and Jesus gave him the law. Yeah. And he confirmed that at the end. When he put them both together, he said, this is all the law and the prophets in those two. Right. Okay, so that's law. Yeah. You have to do this. You have to keep this commandment and love God with everything you have. And you have to love your neighbor the way you love yourself. You have to do this. It's commandments that you're living under, right? Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to, go to John 7, 19. Now, this is John. That was Matthew. This is John. Okay, let's look at the difference. See, John just goes for the jugular. He just lays it out. Matthew isn't going as far. Matthew isn't as evangelistic as John. John just evangelizes the new covenant message of believer and unbeliever. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Matthew is saying that, well, you know, you got to um, uh, you got to keep these commandments. It, well, he did. The man asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? So he told him mm -hmm. and he packaged it all in those two and said, this is all the law and the prophets. Watch this. Okay. Verse 19. Right. 719 of John. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keeps the law. None of you. None of you keeps the law. He says, so why are you trying to see? Why do you seek to kill me? Mm. He says that to say, to show you you're not keeping the law. It's murder. Yeah, they're going to have murder now. You want to kill me? Yeah, yeah. And you think you keep the law. Mm. <sighs> you're not keeping the law. He said, none of you even keeps the law. Right? right? So he says, none of them keep the law. Right? Didn't he say, well, you got to keep up just the, all the law and the prophets. You got to love God. He says, nobody does it. Right? Right, right. It's true. So um, uh, Galatians 6.13. I got so much here. I, really, I put this together really fast. I don't know. I, I, it's hard for me to get it all out here. Mm -hmm. Right? 6.13. Is that what I said? Yeah, 6.13. Yeah, that's right. Okay, 6.13, Galatians 6.13. Okay. Paul says, he says, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law. Who are the circumcised? Who's of the circumcision? The Jews. The Jews. Yeah. So he's saying none of you Jews keep the law. And so the Gentiles definitely don't. Jesus said none of you keep the law. Paul says none of you keep the law. Right. I thought we have to love, I thought all the law and the prophets is in loving God with all your mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor the way you love yourself. According, no, apparently, it. nobody's yeah. doing it. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Right? Yeah. Go to Romans 3.11. Bottom line is we've got to come to the end of ourselves and see our need for a Savior. Okay? If you want to go read all that stuff that you, this is threatening and punishing and scary, the parables and all that threatens. Like Jesus said, if you don't, if, by every other word you speak, you will be condemned. You, if you want to go with that, well, you better feel you better get condemned, mm -hmm. and and see you need a savior. Mm -hmm. That's what that was for. He says, by every idle word you speak, you will be condemned, right? Right. By your words, you will be judged. He said that. Jesus said that. Go. I think it's in Matthew chapter twelve. He said that. Go. You can go read it. You know. Mm -hmm. So you better just go ahead and feel condemned and realize I need a savior because in Christ there is no condemnation. Yeah. Okay. Right. He says, those who believe will not be condemned. Those who don't believe are condemned already. He says that in John. He, John just goes with believer and unbeliever. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's different than what you see elsewhere. Okay? Right? So what do I say? Romans 3.11. Oh, yeah. Romans three, three, uh, yeah, that's Romans 3. Okay, Romans 3.10 says this. For it is written, there is none who are... are okay. Well, let's go back to 9. Okay. He says, what then? Aren't we better than they? He's, he's talking like the Jews. Where they look at the Gentiles, Gentiles and think they don't even have the law. You know, they don't believe in the one true God. Mm -hmm. We do. So aren't we better than they? He says, not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Gentiles, he says Greeks, but that's Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Both Jews and Gen Greeks, are, they are all under sin. He says, for it is written, there is none righteous, no one. There is none who understands. There is none who even seeks after God. What did he say? You got to love God with all your mind and soul and strength. Mm -hmm. But didn't Jesus say none of you keep the law? Right. Didn't Paul say to you, the Jews, none of you keep the law? Mm -hmm. And he was saying, none of you seek after God. How could you be loving God with all your mind, soul, and strength when he says no one 
even seeks him. Right? Right. They have all gone out of the way. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. That guy called Jesus good. He says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Right. Nobody no one, does good. No one does it. Yeah. But he goes on to say, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all miss it by a mile. Mm -hmm. So we need to come to the end of ourselves. Stop being Mr. Sermon on the Mount guy and think you're all that in a bag of chips that we have to do it. People think that now that I have the Holy Spirit, I can keep the law. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, I've heard people say that. Yeah, the Bible never says that. Right. What the Bible says, we're not under law, we're under grace. What the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, it says those who are led by the Spirit are not under the law. It doesn't say not... Yeah. Stay with me now. No, sorry. I was losing you there. No, sorry. Yeah. Come on, man. Sorry. Sorry. Stay with me. Sure. Where was I? Oh. You're saying that the Jews and Gentiles are not even under the law. What was I saying? The Jews and Gentiles are under the law, but they're they're not keeping the law. Huh? The Jews the Je Jews aren't keeping the law. They're not. There's none righteous. No, I was saying so. something else, and I totally lost it now. Um. Okay. Anyways. So. Uh, so it was Romans three nine. Huh? Romans three. Three nine, three ten. Oh my gosh, it was good too. I forgot what it was. Okay. But but anyways, uh, go down to three nineteen. Three nineteen. Three nineteen tells you what Jesus was doing. Okay. Okay. He says, "Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those under the law." See, because Jesus, Matthew was written to the Jews. Jesus is preaching to those. Uh, you know, he's talking to the Jews because he says, "Don't be like those Gentiles." In Matthew, mm -hmm. in the Sermon on the Mount, he constantly says, "Don't be like those Gentiles." So you know, he's dealing with Jews. So he says, we know that whatever the law says, it was said, said to those under the law, the Jews, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That's what Jesus is doing in, 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 in Sermon on the Mount, is he's, he's condemning them, putting them under condemnation, seeing their failure, mm -hmm. so he can silence their pride and stop thinking they're keeping the law, that they're doing a bang-up job of keeping the law. He's silencing their pride and he's showing them their guilt, Right? So they'll see their need for a savior. Mm -hmm. that, that's what. It, that's basically what he's doing, you know. But if you go look at Sermon on the Mount, you know, not one place, not one place in all Sermon on the Mount, Matthew five, six, and seven, does he put himself out there as a solution. Right. He doesn't. He doesn't. He alludes to himself talking about two roads. Yeah. Huh. Right. He's the road that leads to life. He said. He says you have the son, you have life. So he's the road that leads. There's a lot road that leads to destruction. One leads to life. He's the road that leads to life. He talks about two trees. One bears good fruit, one bears bad, bad fruit. Jesus elsewhere said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. You, all those who abide in me will bear fruit, good fruit. Amen. Right? Amen. That's so it. he's the good tree. Yeah. I'm just a branch. I, once I join to him, mm -hmm. I will bear good fruit. Amen. Right? So he, he's talking about two trees, bad fruit, bad fruit, good, good fruit. He's the good tree. He's the way, the, the two roads. Right. He's the, right, the road that leads to life. He's the tree that bears good fruit. In life. Right? Yeah. And the two foundations. Right? Yeah. One house built on rock, one house built on sand. The Bible says that there's no other foundation laid except Jesus Christ. He's the foundation of this rock. Did the, the house stay standing? Yeah. Yeah. That's Jesus. He's the only sure foundation. Right? Right, right. So that's Jesus. He said elsewhere, he said, seek first the righteousness of God, uh, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added. Mm -hmm. So he's alluding to himself. So he's the rights of God. He says, first seek the rights of God and all these things. Uh, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness. Where do you find God's righteousness? In cross, Jesus. In, cross, yeah. in Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Jesus is the only one who is truly right. He says no one is righteous. No, not one. Right, right. So who's the only one who is truly righteous? Jesus. Jesus. So when he says seek first the righteousness of God, get the kingdom of God and his righteousness, where do you find the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Only Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. In Christ. So he alluded to himself, but he never came right out and said that to believe on him. Matter of fact, this is heavy. Let's look at this. I want to show you something. Okay. Much of the time, Jesus said, he told Nic Nicodemus, said, uh, God so loved the world that he sent his son. So he talked about Jesus. He said, those who you believe on, if you believe on him, you won't be condemned. But look how he talked to Martha. Okay. Martha, who was totally believing on Jesus Christ. Martha, who knew he was the Messiah. She even said that. We know you're the Messiah. Right, right. We know you're the son of God. We know you're, we know you're the Christ, the son of God. That's the Messiah. She knew he was the Messiah. She totally believed on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. She was a friend of his. Matter of fact, Jesus loved going to her house all the time. Right, right. Right? Yeah. She loved, he loved going to visit Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, going to their house. So he constantly 
visiting over there because he felt really comfortable there because mm -hmm. they had total faith in him, right? Right, right, right. Right? Uh -huh. Look how he talks to her. Luke 10, uh, 41. Is it Luke 10? Yeah, 41. Oh, thank you. You are good. Look how he talks to her. Mm -hmm. There's none as this son of man, the son of God. Look, this is heavy. Mm -hmm. Look how he talks to her. See, people don't look at this, man. What did I say? What did you say, Luke, Luke 10? Luke 10, 41. Yes. Okay, look at this. Luke 10, 41? Yeah. Okay, here it goes. Um, no, that's not it. Isn't it about when he was at the... Not the at their... No, 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 no. Not uh, at the house. Uh, uh, not at the house. The one where he says... It, where he said... To, um, uh, um, Okay, that's good that you thought about that, but that's not it. Uh, I think it's John 10. I think it's John, John 11. John 11. Okay, good. You know what I'm talking about then. Yeah, now I know what you're talking about. Where he says that you'll never die. Yeah, okay. That right? Be, yeah, John 11. Um... Yeah, death of Lazarus, John 11. Yeah. Good, good, good. This is good. Watch that. I want to see this. When he's talking to Martha, see, that's the thing is when you really believe... That Jesus, really trusting in grace, and you stop doing this legalistic thing, right. God speaks to you, can speak to you openly, clearly, you know, because you're really being led by the Holy Spirit. You're open to hear what he has to say because you're leading from the right place, mm -hmm. okay? He, the, right here, proves that when, when you really believe, when you're seriously believer, God is able to speak to you in a way that he can't speak to other people. Right, right. Watch and, this. And this is Luke, verse 26, right? Huh? 25, 26. Yeah. 20, 20, um, and okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Um, let's start with this. Uh, th um, okay. This is when Jesus comes back to the. To Lazarus had died, mm -hmm. and he sent word to him to come. Lazarus. Uh, no, Lazarus was sick. And they sent word to him to tell him that Lazarus was sick. And he waited. He didn't, he didn't come right away. Right. He, he actually waited till he died. When he, came, uh, uh, he was dead by the time he got there. He, he was de already dead. But it says that he did that because he was going to raise him from the dead. He wanted, you know, that's why he wait, you know, he knew he was going to die and he was going to go and raise him from the dead. Yeah, okay, so he comes back to the, he comes to the, he gets there and Martha comes out to him. Um, in verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting, Mary was sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. So he's saying, listen, he's going to, I'm, he's going to live. Amen. And she says, oh, Martha says to him, I know that he'll rise again, you know, in the resurrection at the last day. She's not thinking that he's going to raise him from the dead right now. Right, right. She's thinking later. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He says, oh, I know, you know, later on he'll raise from the dead. You'll raise. I know. I, I get it. You know, Jesus said to her, no, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me. So you see, he's straight up saying in me. He's not saying the son of man, yeah. the son of God. He's yeah. not dancing around this thing. Right, he yeah. just says those who believe on me. You don't see that nowhere in, in these other places. You, you see this when he's talking to somebody that has faith in him. That no, Look what he says. Mm -hmm. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Mm -hmm. You see that? Right, right. My, my point is, I found it very interesting when he was talking to Martha. Mm -hmm. And she's saying, we know you're the Christ. He, he says, I... How did he say it? I shouldn't. I shouldn't have left that yet. Right. 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 Eleven twenty-five. Yeah. Oh, verse twenty-seven. What she said. Oh yeah, yeah. Jesus said to yeah. I should have kept going. Jesus said to him, "Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Who is the, who is the Christ?" The Son of God that was supposed to come into the world. The long-awaited Messiah. Right. That's what she means. Who is to come into the world? The long-awaited Messiah. Mm -hmm. The Christ. The Son of God. That's just another way of saying the Messiah. Who is going to come. Who, who we've been looking forward to. Is Jesus. That, this is the first coming. Jesus coming. There's a second coming later that we're waiting for. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this is the first coming. Right. That's what she means by to come into the world. So she believed he was the Messiah. Straight up. And that's why Jesus could say... 
believing on me, mm-hmm. not the Son of Man, not the Son of God, straight up, me, right? Right, right. And I believe that, I, that God is able to speak to you in a very, he, God gives me some amazing revelations. I mean, I see things in the Word that people are not seeing. You know, I, I hear other people preach it. Mm-hmm. They are seeing it. It is out there. But and, and a lot of the time, it's confirmation of what God has been showing me. As I hear somebody else, they see it too. You know, so, but you miss out on all of that amazing revelation if you're not leading with grace the way you should. Mm-hmm. So, well, we got to end soon. Okay, so let, let me finish with a few more of these. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Go to Luke 10, 25. I might have to continue this, Luke 10, 25. Mm-hmm. You ready? Yep. Behold, a certain lawyer came up, stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? And he says, says to him, Well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Right? So he, gave, he asked, What must I do to gain eternal life? He said, Law. Yeah, right? Law, yeah. You following me? Yep. Okay, go to Luke 18, 30. Right? 1830? Right. You with me? Yep. Is that right? No. Why you got 1830? That can't be right. What must I do to gain eternal life? Luke 18... Yeah, Luke 18, 18. 18, 18. Oh, it's 18 through 30. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, here it is. And a certain rule, okay, this is two separate situations. You know that because it's in the same book. They're mm-hmm. both in Luke. Right. A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? Mm-hmm. And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Well, you know the commandments. See, again, he gives them law. Right? Right. Um, You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't first false witness. Honor your mother and father. He says, all these are kept in my youth. He says, well, he says, you still lack one thing. Go sell everything you have to the poor. Then then, go go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But the man went away sad. But you see, both times when he asks about eternal life, when two different people ask about eternal life, he gives them the law. Yeah, they go away from right? Yeah. Uh, you you with me? Yeah. Go to John six twenty eight. Remember, they said, "What must we do? What must I do?" Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Both scenarios. What must I do? Law. What must I do? Law. Both scenarios. He gave them com- law. Right. Right. These people come to Jesus and they say. Then they said to him, what shall we do? See, it's a similar thing. What shall we do? What must I do to gain mm-hmm. eternal life? What must I do? They said, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, the same could be said if you say, hey, what must I do to gain eternal life? What did he say? If you receive all those who receive him, he gives the right to become children of God. Amen. That's right? what we would tell people. Yeah, that's what you tell people. Yeah, when you evangelize. It's through receiving Jesus. Right. You don't tell them you have eternal life. Well, do you know the law? Do you know what's in the law? Do you know the commandments? Don't yeah, don't right. lie. Don't steal. Yeah. You want eternal life? You want to go to kingdom? Of God? You want to go to heaven? You want to you want to see God? Do I give them the law today? No. 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 Jesus yeah. did. Yeah. But that's because he was living under the law. Right. We're living under grace. Amen. We don't give people a law if they want to see God, if they Amen. want to do the works of God, no, if, it, if, if, if they want to do the works of God, right. if they want to see eternal life. We don't give them law. law. We're not under law. We're under grace. Mm-hmm. We minister grace and tell them believe and receive Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Confess. Come to a place where you're comfortable confessing him as Lord and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead. You'll get eternal life. Right? Right, right. He says, believe on him and you won't perish, but have eternal life. Mm-hmm. So it's through believe in Jesus Christ. That's where you get eternal life. It's not the stuff that you see Jesus saying over here. Mm-hmm. 
right? You wouldn't say that. See, I don't know. I think I'm proving my point, right? Right. You think? Yep. Um, look at 3.16 and 36. John 3.16 and 36. Do we tell people you got to believe on Jesus? You got to, you got to. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. See, that's where you're going to get eternal life, to believe in on the son. See, Jesus said that too. People land on this, what he said over here, but you got to look at what he said elsewhere. Right, right, right. He said two different things. He had two ministries, right? Right. He did. Mm -hmm. At times he would put it on you. At times he would put it on himself. At times he would impute your sin. At times he wouldn't, Right. Paul said that God was in Christ, reconciling us unto himself, not imputing our sins. Jesus, on many occasions, is imputing them. He says, you call some of you a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. Is he imputing sin? Yes. Absolutely. He says, by every idle word you speak, you will be condemned. Is he imputing your sin? Right. Absolutely. So at times Jesus was imputing your sin. Well, I thought Paul said God was in Christ, not imputing them. Right. He was they don't mix, do they? No, they don't. No. They don't. No. So you got to take what Jesus said in light of what Jesus said through Paul. Jesus is saying this before the cross. Jesus is speaking through Paul after the cross. What do you want to go with? The and Paul. they don't mix. Yeah. Not even a little bit. And I got a whole lot more here. Let me put this up here so you can see what I have. And you can go and study this for yourself because we don't have time to go through all this. But this is what I've got. This is deep. You could, t you could stop this and you can look at all this. But I got dozens and dozens of scriptures there. Was that okay? Oh, you can't tell. I, can't tell. I got dozens of scriptures there. I got so much here, it's not funny. This is the Old Testament, the New Testament. They don't mix. Right? You see that? They don't mix. New covenant, God loves us first. God's not condemning you first. God's giving you total forgiveness first. God says you're accepted and beloved. He's giving you acceptance first. The Bible says we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So he's giving you all spiritual blessings first. He says that Jesus became a curse for you. So he's giving you a no curse first. Okay, Jesus became sin for you. So he's not holding your sin against you first. Okay, you don't earn this. You don't work for that. It's not blessed if you do, you're cursed if you don't under the new covenant. It's not like what Jesus said on many occasions. You got to forgive to be forgiven. You got to earn it. You got to work for it. You can't call somebody a fool, or you will. You can go to hell. Mm -hmm. We don't go to hell because we believe on Jesus Christ. That's why we don't go to hell. Amen. Right? Amen. Believers don't go to hell. But Jesus said it like this. See, that's a funny thing. Jesus said one thing one place. He said another thing another place. He said, you call somebody a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. But elsewhere, he said, you just believe on the Son, you won't perish. You won't go to hell. You'll have eternal life. Right? Mm -hmm. He says in John chapter 3, verse 36, he says, those who believe have eternal life, but those who don't believe, the wrath of God abides on them. John just goes with believer and unbeliever. Go check it out. And that's where we're at today. You know, heavy. Mm -hmm. That's heavy. Father God, thank you for this time. I thank you for this message. I thank you that you've revealed this revelation to me, and I pray that I can get this message out so other people can enjoy the true nature, your true nature. Understand what, get out of this, this covenant confusion and understand that Jesus did teach two covenants. Father, I thank you. Um, I pray that our day goes out fine today. Um, I pray, pray for the message today, Pastor's message, that it, uh, that your Holy Spirit he, have, give him a double, give her a, a double anointing for the message. I think it's 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 um, it's a, the lady going up there today. Um, I pray, Father God, that um, I just uh, I pray for my brother Dylan, Father God, that you meet him where he's at and help him get where he needs to be. Father God, and myself too, Father, in the name of Jesus, amen and amen.